Good morning uh, and welcome. I'm Dr. Tim Lewis, Chair of the VIU History Department and your moderator for the morning. Thank you for joining us today for the third and final of the fall events in VIU's 2016-2017 Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series. As we meet this morning, please be mindful and appreciative that we do so on the traditional territory of the Sunemo First Nation. I also want to extend a note of thanks this morning on behalf of the Arts and Humanities Colloquium Planning Committee for the work and leadership of the new committee chair, Dr. Catherine Rollwagon from the History Department as well. Uh, Catherine, if you wanna, there she is over there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> By the way, don't let her pleasant demeanor fool you. She is a fearsome taskmaster who drives us to the edge of, of, of our sanity, but produces results. No, I'm obviously just kidding. Uh, Catherine is, in fact, a fount of positive energy, and we all really appreciate her contributions, not only to the committee, but to the history department, too. Very thankful. And finally, I want to acknowledge yet again that the colloquium series would not be possible without the vital moral and financial support provided by the Dean of Arts, Dr. Ross McKay, and all those who work in his office. And thank you once again for joining us this morning and not being tempted to join the vast hordes out there searching for seasonal holiday bargains. Um, but we have quite a deal for you this morning, too. No payment for 90 days. Heck, actually no payment at all. And we're, we're going to actually give you something this morning, a lot of stimulating thought, free of charge. You might have even got a cookie as a bonus. So this is a pretty good deal, really, when you think about it. So on with the show. Please welcome Dr. Ian Whitehouse, uh, professor of English at VIU's Cowichan campus, as he is here to formally introduce the main speaker for the morning, Dr. Paul Watkins, VIU uh, Department of English, as he, through the work of Wade Compton, takes us on a journey to Hogan's Alley, uh, an historic uh, African-Canadian neighborhood in Vancouver. But first, Dr. Whitehouse. Thank you. <clears throat> the difficult thing about uh, needing reading glasses is that once you take the other glasses off, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's difficult to find your reading glasses. Anyway, <clears throat> thank you. So uh, this morning I have the privilege and pleasure of introducing you to one of the bright young scholars that will shape the Vancouver Island University's English and Literary Studies. Uh, Paul Watkins joined us in the fall of 2014. I myself encountered Paul for the first time in the spring of that year at a interview session for a temporary position within our English department. <clears throat> The thing that impressed me the most at that session was Paul's prodigious scholarly activity, which expressed itself in, let me recall, over 50 book and film and interviews, a guest stint as a editor along with Dr. Rachel Kane for the Critical Studies and Improvisation on an edition, appropriately, on improvisation and hip hop. And 36 conference papers delivered in a three year period, all of which he did while writing his doctorate. <clears throat> Overcoming my own petty jealousy, I recommended that we invite him back. <clears throat> Eight months later, in case we were uh, negligent in realizing what he could bring to our department, Paul, in his usual understated way, asked if we could kindly review his CV as we interviewed him for a permanent posting within our department. Uh, that updated CV after eight months now included four more pages of publications and conference papers. <clears throat> um, not surprisingly, uh, soon after the interview, 
<clears throat> excuse me, we offered and Paul accepted a permanent posting with our department. Having several years now to observe Paul, if you were to ask me what impresses me about Paul, and believe me, I still remain impressed, I would say it's his immense capacity for play. Yes, that's right, play. But it's not a frivolous play. It's a creative, intellectual force that he applies to everything he does, to his morning ritual where his young son, Phoenix, and he select a jazz album that they will play that day, to his collaboration with Sam Van Hell, our work op student, as they work together in our college and innovation lab, printing parts that will eventually produce a gramophone that plays music. <clears throat> Frederick Schiller, in his Aesthetic Education of Mankind, identifies this same force as, thank goodness, Katerina's not here, Spieltrieb, the play drive, to which he attributes the power, the capacity to unite the intellect with the senses, reason with imagination. Paul does this to an incredible degree in everything he does, from his family life to his teaching to his scholarly production, as we will see in a few minutes. The result is a creative improvisation that invokes and samples the past, mixes and critiques the present, and gestures audibly to the future. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Not surprisingly then, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul's presentation today, given his playful inclination and his love of jazz, will focus on an Afro-Canadian poet, writer, historian, and DJ. More specifically, on a creative, evocative reappropriation and representation of Hogan's Alley, a four block area in East Vancouver that formed the first concentrated Afro American community. A community that was torn down to facilitate the building of the Georgia Viaduct in the early 1970s. Gone in the name of, quote, urban renewal, was a cultural community, a vibrant place where some of the best jazz musicians came to play. To that I can testify because my friend Conroy would phone me in the middle of the night and say, hey, Charlie Watts is playing tonight. Get out of bed. <clears throat> anyway, although that of Hogan Zelly's buildings has been assigned to the past, its, its ambience, its history has been reassigned to the eternal present of poetry, how, by whom, and for what reasons is the subject matter of today's presentation. And on that note, I would like you to welcome my friend and my colleague, Professor Paul Watkins. Paul? <clears throat> Just as, just as a side note, as you will see, stepping onto the stage is Darren Nicole, a third year 
jazz student uh, who will accompany periodically the presentation. Thank you for your attention. It's okay if we make a little bit of noise to uh, get things going. This opening piece, it's about mashup culture, one of the things I'm going to be talking about in relation to uh, Wade Compton's poetry is what I term a, a mashup pedagogy or a, or a DJ methodology. And uh, we're going to open up by just making a little bit of noise. This piece was largely inspired by the, the Vancouver Art Gallery had an exhibition uh, this summer earlier this year on mashup culture. So it's inspired by this. I'll be manipulating samples on, a, on this old device here. It's a, an analog sampler where I've taken uh, various recordings from the artist James Brown and recontextualized them into a number of cut up samples. So we'll be playing that live and Darren will be joining me on bass. Uh, later we'll be reading a little bit of Compton's poetry as well and uh, Darren will be accompanying me for that. Mashup Methodology 1. In the 20th century, a new art form would emerge called mashup. It incorporated found images, objects, and sounds. Listen. It is a fusion of disparate elements, carefully crafted juxtaposition. Its strategies are collage based, papier collé, photo montage, remix sound, decoupage, bricolage, assemblage, DJ as curator at the modern exhibition. Mashup is a critical methodology, mixing theory and method to produce a new object image economy, new modes of production and design with an awareness to the fundamental issues of our time, such as race, gender, and intellectual property. A modus operandi at the edge of new technologies that co-design, hack, remix, sample, cut, copy, paste, scratch, and recombine. Mashup is as old as quotation, inhabitation, appropriation, and collaboration. It challenges the traditional mode of being in the world, of understanding the self, of speaking about nation. Two, art can function as a site of social memory, a narrative of movement and displacement. Ralph Ellison heard T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland and William Burroughs heard in it The Cut. The notion of originality is blurred in the new cultural landscape by the twin figures of DJ and programmer cultural architects who select objects and insert them into new contexts. The DJ, web surfer, and post-production artists create paths through culture. They are semionauts who connect the dots. The sampler is a tool. It is a machine that implies constant activity, listening as a way through, navigation as artistic practice. We can look back at the early 20th century and find Picasso and George Brack experimenting with rudimentary assemblage practices. The modernists were making it up as they went along, remixers creating a modern renaissance. Mashup is as old as literature itself. Consider Homer. The Iliad and Odyssey are remixes of oral poetry. See Montaigne's elusive essays or Shakespeare's recycled plots. We move from analog to digital, or from bard to criminal. Mashup is the paradigm that helped redefine image reading, image making, and sound creation. It is a response to absolute authority. Still, the revolution cannot be summarized in 140 characters or less. Three. Picasso was unafraid. See Guernica, his work helped define the decade. Duchamp was a renegade making ready-mades that were, well, you know, already made. John Cage showed that everything we do is music, even without a single note played, while Beyonce served up lemonade with lyrics that explode in ears like hand grenades. 
And if all the world's a stage, Shakespeare show that everything we do is play. Tradition is open to revision. See the work of Christian Marclay or Ai Weiwei, helping to expand the picture frame like Rauschenberg's Flatbird picture plane. John Luke Godard took cinema into the new wave using innovation to rearrange the everyday till it was strange like Tarantino's Pulp Fiction plays the hybrid game. Paratactic blacksmiths using postmodern tactics like Basquiat's neo-expressionist magic or Charlie Parker blowing freely. They both flew high then crashed so tragic. Hear the ancestors speaking back in Lee Scratch Perry's dub tracks or his echoing song in M. Norbasi Phillips' long poem Zong. Hear it in Louis Armstrong's creation of modern time or in Lauren Hill's rhymes. You can even walk through Hogan's Alley via Stan Douglas circa 1948. Stop and contemplate as poet Wade Compton puts history down upon the dub plate. Remix. It's a way to do away with the old templates of hate. Remix is engaged, polemical. It pushes through with love, and love trumps hate. Thank you, Darren. That was fairly improvised as we sort of only had a few minutes to practice what we would do there. Uh, the musical dialogism of my opening piece is drawn from my own listening practice, and it provides one version of the multi-layered endeavor that comes with critically reflective sampling practices. It was an ode to some of the best mashup artists, as well as an investigation of those valuable moments where fragmentation becomes the poetic act itself. Mashups, as Lisa Coulthard outlines, rub sources against each other, layering incongruous cultural products and reworking references through new combinations, associations, and contexts. After delving a little further into mashup as a methodology, I will turn to Wade Compton's poetic practice, focusing on his 2004 work, Performance Bond, which uses remix to reanimate Hogan's Alley. Hogan's Alley was a neighborhood in downtown Vancouver that was home to many immigrant communities, but is perhaps best remembered for the African-Canadian population that had established itself there by the 1920s. In 1967, the city of Vancouver began leveling the western half of the neighborhood to make way for a freeway, which displaced this historical community. Combining poetry images and a sound CD recording, which I think was pretty unique in 2004 when this book came out, Compton reading is uh, various sections of some of his work, Compton reanimates the community and the ruin of Hogan's Alley by listening and experiencing how Wade Compton reimagines and recovers Hogan's Alley. We can be begin to think, you know, if we want to make a leap, uh, to the kind of work we do in scholarship, even citizenship, as a kind of sampling or an engaged poetics. In some ways, my own methodology, what I term a DJ methodology, is similar to what Wade Compton describes as schizophonophilia. <laughs> uh, schizo, right, being multiple, phono being sound, and philia being love, which he describes as the love of audio interplay, uh, the pleasure of critical disruptions to natural addition, the counter hegemonic affirmation that can be achieved through acoustic intervention. I like the notion of acoustic intervention as a reminder that democracy, as embodied in sound, is most effective when it is most free. Sampling becomes a new way of doing something that has been with us for a long time, creating meaning with found objects. As DJ Spooky describes in a manner very similar to Ezra Pound's own poetic dictum to make it new, he says, the mix breaks free from the old associations. The sound of thought becomes legible again at the edge of new meanings. Compton's useful neologism, neologism is when you mash words together essentially, schizophonophilia appropriates and contests what Canadian acoustic ecologist and composer R. Murray Schaefer terms schizophonia. Schaefer defines schizophonia as a dislocation of the voice from the body through recording technologies and electronic amplification. However, through the unsettling nature of being mixed race in North America, Compton embraces this rupture between the natural world and the decentralized body and author precisely because it is unsettling. Compton's mix doesn't merely receive, but rather troubles race and nation. Schaefer points out that the Nazis were among the earliest adopters of the loudspeaker, and he suggests that imperialism is a radiophonic ideology. However, Compton, for the most part, finds Schaefer's concerns. He was writing in the 
mid-70s, have been undercut by DJs who recombine sounds split from their sources. The phonograph turntable is the perfect medium for this split, disembodied message of acoustic intervention. As Compton describes the phonograph as, quote, a machine turned inside out, a machine whose workings are always visible, whose interface is literally tangible, whose production of sound is visceral. The body of the phonograph, like the body of a racialized object, can never close. You can see just how tactile some of these early recording devices are, particularly Bell's ear phonograph from uh, 1874 there. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell created his version of a phonograph using the ear and a part of a skull of a dead man obtained by one of his associates. So he's an actual human ear and part of a skull. Uh, he attached a recording stylus to the ear to inscribe a line on, smoked, on a smoked glass plate. When he shouted into the dead man's ear, the stylus recorded his speech on the glass. Through the medium of disembodied sound, yet always of the body, as we can see in Bell's ear phonograph, the experience of being mixed raced and that subjectivity is made sonically tangible by showing how race and identity formation never fully close. Schizophonia, schizophonophilia, in terms of mixed race individuals, is an opening. The DJ poet digs into the crates of the past to recover soundscapes and to assert the notion that neither sounds nor identities are stable. Compton told me about an interview he did with the writer George Bowering, who told him that sounds are always going extinct. Reflecting on his days using a typewriter, he said that at night, because there were so many writers in Kitsilano, that you'd be coming home from the bar, and you would hear coming out all the windows, all the sounds of the typewriter. And if you think even further back, before recording technologies, there's all kinds of sounds that are lost. In line with Schaefer's concerns, we can actually think of DJing as creating an ecological soundscape that preserves forgotten recordings. Everyone who merges, converses, counterpoints, and unites a variety of text together is essentially creating a mix, just as the DJ often uses the recorded medium as archive or repertoire. However, the, re the archive is not stagnant. Rather, in relation to versioning, anyone can remix, reshape, re-edit a piece of recorded history creating his or her own mix. Listen to Thelonious Monk's Underground, and then flip the script and hear Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. Then read Ralph Ellison, who was reading Dostoevsky, who was likely reading Dante, and read Amiri Baraka's Systems of Dante's Hell, as he was probably reading Richard Wright's The Man Who Lived Underground, along with the other three. We've been sampling one another since we've been writing, speaking even. As DJ Spooky proclaims, DJing is writing, writing is DJing as writing takes the voice and captures it through the technology of a written tra tradition. Music and recording and live performance engage this split, and the word phonograph acknowledges this juncture in its very name. Phono in Greek denotes sound and voice, and graph on the other hand signifies writing. Thus, we can think of a phonograph and later machines like the turntable or even a computer as sound writers, essentially, Inscription is at the root of any kind of writing. By using various intertexts like a vessel slash DJ, Compton challenges existing discourses and introduces neglected histories, as we'll soon see, particularly the history of Hogan's Alley. And he connects these various voices together in a way similar to how a DJ creates a mix. Perhaps the greatest misnomer about DJs is that they want to destroy tradition. Rather, the DJ is often one of the most studious students of musical history and tradition. His or her ear, like Bell's ear phonograph, is glued to the past. Indeed, a mashup methodology can push back and challenge what has been received by society. We see it, for example, in urban use in the late 70s and early 80s using beats, rhymes, graffiti, and breaking to speak truth to power. We see it in Lin-Manuel Miranda's hip-hop musical Hamilton. We see it in VIU's art installation of the witness blanket made up of hundreds of items reclaimed from residential schools, churches, government buildings, and traditional and cultural structures across Canada. More recently, we see it in the memes, remixes, collages, and responses to the recent political campaign and social unrest following Trump's win in the US. And we see it here, for example, in prototypes by Brian Youngin, who's of First Nations and Swiss ancestry, 
and who takes the Nike shoes, which have similar colors to the Northwest Coast First Nations masks, to create new objects by reassembling them. The work gets us to think about ritual and tradition within the larger sphere of globalization, rubbing sources together. We also see it here in Emner B.C. Phillips' long poem, Zong, as it deals with the actual legal case, Gregson versus Gilbert, in Britain, where slavers threw 150 Africans overboard in order to save cargo because supplies were running low. And uh, Nurbasi Philip deals with the language of the actual legal case and reworks it, resamples it, mashes it. Uh, when I spoke to her, she said she tries to introduce the sounds of scratching and turntablism into that mix, constantly reworking it. This is a part from the end of, near the end of the text called the Bora, about the underwater spirits, uh, where by happenstance, her printer pa uh, printed two pages at once and mashed them together. And she thought that was kind of brilliant and left it in there. Again, right, sources are rubbed together to make the past relevant in the present. And of course, we might be more familiar with this, with this in you know, sonic mashups. Uh, for example, you uh, might have heard of DJ Danger Mouse's Grey album. What he did there is he mashed the Beatles' White album with uh, Jay-Z's The Black album to form this album, the Grey Album, only using sounds from the White Album. There's not a single sound in terms of the sonic atmosphere. Uh, the, the beats he made, he only used the White Album and the acapellas from Jay-Z's The Black Album. Both albums act as pivots on which we can examine both artists' past and futures, serving as a kind of biographical, if not musical, um, apotheosis. So in this piece here, I'm just gonna play a very short clip, sampling from uh, Glass Onion, Right, uh, which is John Lennon's snarky assessment of uh, being a Beatle, uh, mixed with Jay Z's uh, piece Encore. <laughs> Sweet. This is the party samples from. Uh, I'm contending that Compton is doing something similar in the way that he mashes different sources together, oral, written, sonic, visual, black, white, local, global, and so on. Because the archive of recorded material is so vast, the creative possibilities of endless recontextualization are apparent. Basically, creativity resonant to a degree in all artistic forms rests in how you recontextualize the previous expressions of others. The DJ, much like the scholar, is a cultural archivist. DJs collect thousands of pieces of recorded music to construct a present from the vast archive of recorded material, participating in, as Jonathan Stern attests, a self-consciously political and historiographic project. The rise of the DJ fits with the postmodern desire of contemporary masses to bring things closer. Technology changes culture, and the invention of the Technique's 1200 series of turntables made DJ culture largely possible in the first place, even though the Techniques 1200 was never intended to be repur repurposed as a musical instrument. Then again, uh, Aldo Sax, who invented the saxophone in 1846, could never have imagined Charlie Parker playing Coco or John Coltrane playing Giant Steps. The Techniques 1200, in hip hop they're often referred to as the ones and twos or the wheels of steel, with its direct drive high torque motor designed initially, made it suitable for cueing and starting tracks on the radio, although young DJs in New York would soon realize how much you could do with a turntable and some records. As Compton writes in The Reinventing Wheel, the author was born in 1972, a direct reference to the invention of the Technique's 1200 turntable, the primary signifier of hip hop and DJ culture. DJ culture insinuates that nothing 
especially music is fixed. The whole world is manipulable. Compton shows how a reference can be lifted to complicate our understanding of how we remember the past. Compton's poem, Performance Bond, opens with a uh, reference to the song As Time Goes By, made popular in the film Casablanca by substituting the word fundamental with multicultural. The multicultural things apply as time goes by. The manipulation of the chorus of As Time Goes By further recalls the famous opening line, you must remember this, which emphasizes that as time goes by, immigrant and migrant histories are often written over or forgotten. Compton reminds us that in BC and in Canada, with the exception of First Nations, everybody's a migrant, everybody gyrates to the Everybody gyrates to the global big beat, and multiculturalism can't arrive by forgetting, but remembering, because those who don't remember, repeat. Challenging official state history and state-sponsored multiculturalism, Compton connects the migrant and multicultural experience to the cross-border embodiment of the global big beat. Using the cut-up method, although more Grandmaster Flash than William S. Burroughs, Compton emphasizes that even though Vancouver exists on the peripheries of empire and time has gone by, that bodies and physical stories still inhabit the geography and are in need of recovery and sounding. As Joanne Leo writes in relation to performance bond, quote, issues of geography are implied here. Whether these are hectares taken from First Nations peoples or non-white communities in Vancouver who lost their neighborhoods to urban redevelopment. Remembering becomes an act of recovery at the crossroads of erasure. By confounding and circling within defined borders, Compton's poetics essentially ask, what does citizenship sound like in BC? Through his schizophono poetics, if we can call it that, Compton melds these past histories into his work, and he does so with the aesthetic ear of a DJ. In the poem DJ, from Compton's first poetry collection, 49th parallel psalm, the short and jam lines recall a DJ scratching. Conduit of the herd, shepherd of the unheard, hands on vinyl scratches, bring that beat back catches, the loop on the off beat matches, that per minute mi mix like magic. The poem DJ is itself a flip, a reverse, a mirror image of the earlier poem JD from the same collection, which looks at James Douglas first governor of British Columbia as mixed race. Father Scottish, mother from British Guyana, and who passed as white. James Douglas's own blackness was the subject of rumor and speculation. The historical record shows that Governor Douglas was indeed of mixed race ancestry, but passed as white his entire life. Compton asks, oh, James Douglas, did you ever see yourself in us? Did you ever stop in your war versus the wilderness and think we? The poem mixes black and white identifications as the crossfader, right? That's the, the mixer on the turntable that allows you to move between the multiple sounds. Blends, shuffling passports, a balancing act too much for 19th century Douglas, who encouraged blacks to come to BC from California, but then withdrew his support when they arrived. Compton's inversion of the title J.D. as D.J. invites the reader into the mix as co-performer of the poem. As D.J. archivist trickster, Compton digs into the crates of the past and finds that there are unlimited sample stories to be played and remixed, writing, more singles in the crates than scrolls in the ancient library of Alexandria. Dropping the turntable's needle on the historical record of the past is about resonance in the present as DJing becomes an apt metaphor for rewriting, re-inscription. As Compton explains to writer and critic Nigel Thomas, his mixing of multiple voices samples, quote, forces a slower reading and suggests multiple meanings and asks for full reader participation. Language, like music, creates virtual space and takes us there as readers, recalling Henry Lefebvre's 1974 text, The Production of Space, in which he writes, Rhythms and all their multiplicity interpenetrate one another in the body and around it. As on the surface of water, rhythms are forever crossing and recrossing, superimposing themselves upon each other, always bound to space.
In 2010, in Vancouver, I saw Compton cast his own poetry from Performance Bond in relation to other works that deal with notions of hybridity, DJ culture, and Canadian citizenship, emulated by the music's own polyphonic layering of sound and thematic. The performance involved a sampler and three turntables. The sampler plays a vocal clip of Compton reading from his poem, The Reinventing Wheel, while the entire performance is cued to various electro and hip hop beats with the aid of co-performer and turntablist Jason Decudo, who's uh, in the background there in the red, Compton's in the foreground. As Compton suggests, sampling provides the power and focus of recontextualization. Now you can't see this too clear. I was told that the clearer my slides are, unfortunately, the fuzzier, the fuzzier they get, but perhaps that's an apt metaphor for the faded past needing to be recovered. We'll go with that. In The Reinventing Wheel, Compton samples Ziggy Marley's words from Tomorrow People, or perhaps he samples Public Enemy, since a vocal clip in the opening of Fear of a Black Planet contains the same phrase. Compton writes, my family history is fractured, impure, history imported with deft, warp, and weft. You don't know your past, you don't know your future, history imperative. The alliterative warp and weft refers to the weaving, the weft, yarn, is drawn through the warp, the lengthwise yarn, which is a perfect metaphor for how Compton spins and weaves histories together. African-Canadian history, as remembering, is a creative act that urgently seeks innovative ways to remember and recreate a past elided by mainstream culture and history. Compton's most fully realized single poem in Performance Bond, The Reinventing Wheel, is populated by ghosts and spirits of the past, even as it uses new forms and technologies to reinvent the wheel, a larger symbolic metaphor for the turntable or the wheels of steel. Quote, um, Ghosts haunt embody these techniques, speaking to the brokenness, the tradition. Compton's own inspirational home, community, hood of Hogan's Alley exists only in the ghosting of history and the portals of retold stories. He tells, it's a thin lane between Hogan's Alley and self-hatred, my ghosthood, those old standards. Compton's own disembodied voice, he often performs the reinventing wheel by manipulating a recording of himself reading sections of the poem, speaks to the loss of a community that was put under erasure. Through a resampling ghosting, ghosting process, that community can never be erased. Compton quotes and draws inspiration from a number of figurative sources, sampling, for example, in the single poem, Jimi Hendrix, right, Purple Haze Trail Blazer, Chuck D of the hip hop group Public Enemy, Shango, the Yoruba god of fire, lightning and thunder, Osiris, the Egyptian god of the afterlife, James Brown, godfather of soul, Raju, a thunder animal of Japanese mythology, Thoth, the Egyptian god of knowledge, Curtis Blow, an early hip hop pioneer, Legba, the voodoo god of the crossroads, Prometheus, and many others. His strategy is clearly DJ and hip hop inspired. Sampling, a key component of hip hop production, is used throughout the reinventing wheel. Quote, snatch it back and hold it, Junior Wells told us, and arrested development sampled it. The line is directly followed by a reference to the biblical Moses and passing passage as Moses is implicated in the groove moving the text. As he, quote, snatched back and held and took the people to the bridge. Compton describes the poetic powers of the ones and twos of the turntables, quote, he says, the cornerstones of hip hop, the DJ's materials, the left and the right turntable, two halves of a dichotomy. The poetry would arise through the cultural feedback these loops would spark. The agency in the poem is found in the manipulation of history and source culture. Well, we would just perform a little bit of the reinventing wheel through our own reinterpretation. If Darren would like to join me on stage, we'll just give you some samplings in the later part of this presentation of some of Compton's work. Moses says the speaker, can you take us to the bridge? Can you hit it and quit? 
can you shake your meaning maker, old restless spook? Speak us out of this mess, this unpassable test, this pattern. Hold it back and snatch it. Fix that word, cause the shit is broke. Write it in stone, Xerox the tablets. Cause Lord knows the author got to get over. Take us home, keep it real, word is bond. The author was born in 1972. In 1972, the Matsushita Electric Industrial Company introduced the Technique's SL-1200 turntable. They did not pay respects to Zhanggu or Raju, and that is the source of the wow and flutter of our souls. The word is the body of Osiris. It's spliced. A communion is happening worldwide, a whirlwind of performances. Black English, black expropriation scattered to the four corners. Every ear shall hear. The word of the prophets are written in graph. James Brown never said, say it loud, I'm mixed race in the satellite of the US and proud. There's no echo, but there is culture. And I'm an instrument of the verge. Cupping the snail shell to my ear, hearing and placing the phrases brought forth from rock by thoth, the living palindrome and magician. Transcription is the fixing of fiction as history, and speaking is the encryption of the world as euphony. Every ear shall hear, every eye shall see. We ain't maintaining, yet we be defamiliar. My family history is fractured, impure. History imported with deft warp and weft. You don't know your past, you don't know your future. History imperative. You don't maintain, yet it gets told. We got a couple more for you. So, okay. so Hogan's Alley was the local unofficial name for Park Lane, an alley that ran through the southwestern corner of Strathcona in Vancouver during the first six decades of the 20th century. It ran between Union and Prior Street from approximately Main Street to Jackson Avenue. I don't know if you can see there that it's a T-shaped alley. Right, and this is where the Georgia Viaduct would disrupt that part of the alley and community and displace that community. Here's a, some, just a shot I took from uh, Google Maps so you can get a sense of where it fits within the larger sphere of Vancouver. It wasn't only a black neighborhood either. It was, uh, you know, Italian immigrants traced their history here too. It was right on the edge of Chinatown, but it did have a cluster of black businesses and a church that was particularly significant to the black community. The history of black immigrants arriving in British Columbia, mostly from California, dates back to 1858. Most of these black settlers initially settled in Victoria and on Salt Spring Island. Actually, half of Salt Spring Island's initial population was black. Uh, but eventually, many moved to Vancouver as it gradually became the economic epicenter of BC. In Vancouver, they made their homes on the east side in the southern part of Strath Strathcona, a working class neighborhood that would become known as Hogan's Alley. By the 1920s, the black community had built an African Methodist Episcopal church and opened various businesses. And by 1940, the black population had reached some 800 people in that community. The closely knit black community was largely the result of the community's proximity to the train stations, since sleeping car porters were predominantly black men. All of the major vaudeville acts passed through Vancouver as circuits moved by train. Further, the musical scene in Hogan's Alley, which included many local acts like the Crump Twins, prefigured what we now refer to right, as the cliched Hollywood North, um, and featured some of the biggest names in music who would pass through and perform in the bars there. Everybody from Sammy Davis Jr., Ella Fitzgerald, Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and countless others. Vancouver's own musical history has its share of cross-cultural mavericks who, for a period, made the downtown east side, right, in or around Hogan's Alley, uh, for a period of time, their home. At the Patricia Hotel, jazz legend Jelly Roll Morton joined the house band and played there between 1919 and 1921. He played piano, gambled, drank, told body jokes, and sang during his residency. Nora Hendricks, a former vaudeville dancer and the paternal uh, grandmother of Jimi Hendrix, immigrated to Vancouver in 1911 and helped found the black church in Hogan's Alley. 
Jimi Hendrix would often visit Vancouver and even live there during the winter of 1962 to 1963, where he practiced and often played in the nightclubs. Today in Van uh, Vancouver's downtown east side, there's a shrine dedicated to Jimi Hendrix. Both Jelly Roll Morton and Jimi Hendrix, I think, deserve honorary Canuck status despite their American origins. Like BC's own history of flux, both musicians represent music as a crossing of unbound possibility. While Vancouver provided a more hospitable environment to black people than the US, Vancouver could be particularly hostile to racial others. In Inlet, Holler from Performance Bond, Compton further implicates his own unease as a settler. His ancestors did not arrive as slaves, viewing the Vancouver Inlet as, quote, no more mine than yours, writing that, like others, he just happens to be here. I am a settler. I am uneasy. There is nowhere to go. In his poem, Illegalese, Floodgate Dub, Compton reflects on the media backlash against the Fujianese migrants who arrived in Canada by ship. In the summer of 1999, nearly 600 Chinese migrants arrived in BC in four dilapidated boats in one shipping container. The majority had paid at least $30,000 to smugglers for their passage, and many did not survive the trip. While every migrant got due process, although certainly not fair process, 444 of the 577 refugee claims were rejected. Most were sent back home, a home that they had fled in desperation in the first place. Critic Larissa Lai addresses the crisis as one around legitimacy, particularly asking, who has the right to say who comes and goes? Compton remixes this incident, writing, if you arrive in the belly of a rusting imagination, there are grounds to outlaw you. Compton points out the hypocrisy of Canada, right, a country that likes to heroically remember itself as a haven for the runaway slave, but then asks, why is it vilifiable for Chinese migrants to hide in the belly of a dream now? Performance Bond provides voice to those who are considered illegal and without citizenship status, interrogating Canada's history of exclusion, zooming in on the historical community of Hogan's Alley. Compton writes in his essay, Seven Roots to Hogan's Alley, that Vancouver's black community suffered what their American cousins, punning on the term urban renewal, called Negro removal, the destruction of the politically weakest community of a city for large modernist planning schemes. Hogan's Alley is named after Richard Outkalt's cartoon entitled Hogan's Alley, published between 1894 to 1896, and which featured a fictional New York ghetto with crowded streets and urban squalor, and it was particularly racist to uh, the Irish. This depiction fits the public perception of Hogan's Alley at the time, described by journalist Jack Stepler as standing for three things, squalor, immorality, and crime. Today we would say it is a ghetto, but back in those days they would often say something like it's a regular Hogan's Alley. And while Hogan's Alley was hardly perfect, Compton reminds readers we must be careful not to romanticize Hogan's Alley, having been told he was lucky not to have grown up there. Despite the poor living conditions, Hogan's Alley was brimming with honest laborers, black businesses, a newspaper press, and a church. The removal of the community under the guise of an urban renewal project, the proposed building of an overpass, was, as Compton describes, old-fashioned racism. Freeways were in invariably run through black neighborhoods or Chinatowns poor districts whose populations were least able to lobby, lobby civic governments. Hence, citizenship afforded different rights for those living in the more prosperous, predominantly white, west end of downtown Vancouver than it did for those living in Vancouver's east side. Compton told me that his initial need to work on the recovery of black British Columbian history came out of a raw necessity to, quote, to understand black history in the province in Western Canada, we were at first focused on a memorial, a public memorial, and then as we got rolling, we realized we didn't know much. So then it became more about information, consciousness raising, and information gathering. 
Compton goes on to describe that the project was always intended to be a multicultural one, one that is not merely for black folks, but rather is, quote, a history of the city, and we got a lot of help from non-black people, and I thought that was right. That was how it should be. Compton's performance of making Hogan's Alley come to life again is a historical imperative to present a fuller and more multicultural understanding of Vancouver than history books often depict. So that's not quite a rune, the image there, it's, uh, which are, tip runes are typically Nordic uh, in nature, but that's from the voodoo tradition. That's the uh, veve, uh, symbolic image of Papa Legba, who's the voodoo trickster uh, at the crossroads that Compton often invokes. Rune, uh, the title of the final section of Performance Bond, is a word with multiple meanings that appropriately animate Compton's magical, cryptic, and performative lament for Hogan's Alley. Rune also sounds apocalyptically close to ruin, recalling the ruins and visual remains of Hogan's Alley. Creating space for Vancouver's historical and present black community, Compton recreates visual poetry by including graffiti signs, voodoo symbols, pictures, a simulated newspaper, a facsimile of a Vancouver Daily News article, and various typographic characters that don't necessarily come from written words. Much of Rune riffs on the historical record, and Compton elaborates that Rune is about the memory of Hogan's Alley, and specifically, the problem of how to remember Hogan's Alley. The poem deals with the ambivalence of looking back and the enduring curiosity of those times and conditions. Compton opts for semi-hoaxes based on real historical places, since a fully realistic representation is itself a kind of imaginative impossibility. Right? He often restages some of the, the um, through photographs, some of the old uh, landmarks of uh, Hogan's Alley. For example, here's one, the Far Cry Weekly. By staging and misduplicating various historical works, a newspaper article, oral histories, and landmarks like you see there, Compton's Hogan's, Compton's Hogan's Alley and Rune provides, as critic Joanne Leo suggests, dense layers of historical, literary, and theoretical intertext that allow Compton to have them interact and create new ways of understanding his contemporary context. Compton's photographic staging of Black Vancouver is not intended, as he explains to hoax readers, but rather to at once allegorize the ontological feelings emanating from the social and historical conditions, to experiment formally with cultural memorialization as a representational act. Understandably, Compton feels anxious creating manufactured images of a community in the midst of a difficult, real memorialization. But the process is intended to engage readers in the act of recreating the blighted history of Hogan's Alley. Hence, it makes sense that the first poem in Rune concerns the various historical and physical blank spaces of Hogan's Alley. Through creative interplay, Compton imaginatively fills those lacunas, those historical gaps. And I'm just going to read just the first stanza from Blight. Compton leaves blank spaces in the poem for the reader to fill, but I thought it would be fun to just have Darren improvise a few of those spaces. Blight. When take pictures of there are no people there. The decay will speak for itself. Nothing in the city is older than space. Nothing closer than time. Muted, eight-balled, low crisscrossed and fameless, half-named and ghosted, false creep too. So Blight opens with an invitation to the reader to fill in the empty and abandoned spaces of the poem, much like the missing landmarks of Hogan's Alley, when blank take blank pictures of blank, there are no people there, the decay will speak for itself. Blight, as a term, refers to any baleful influence of atmospheric or invisible origin that suddenly blasts, nips, or destroys plants, 
as well as any malignant influence of obscure or mysterious origin that causes destruction. Hogan's Alley was described by builder inspectors and the city as a blighted neighborhood that was essentially diseased and which needed to be cut out from the city for fear the squalor would spread. Here's a, a short video clip uh, describing blight taking place in uh, Vancouver. It's from the, a recent documentary called The Secret History of Hogan's Alley. Blight is death to a city. Most of Vancouver is kept strong and healthy through the normal process of land and building renewal. But in areas such as this, nothing happens except dilapidation and decay gets worse each year. Property values fall, and blight is the result. In the poem Blight, Compton cleverly uses blank spaces, silence, to show how Hogan's Alley has been historically blighted. Blank spaces in the poem represent missing details, abandonment and erasure, as well as a certain historical whitewashing, as words in the blank ink have been replaced by white spaces that Compton then rebuilds into new structures and sites of performance. The blank spaces in the poem also function like a close test a psychological exercise in which a person is required to supply words which have been deliberately omitted from a passage. Hence, historians, writers, and politicians might deliberately om omit important passages of a people's history, but those deliberate omissions can, at times, be creatively recovered, providing an opening or a closing. Quote, instead of a shutter, it could have been an opener, a closer, a closure, a close test, a flutter. Compton's playful literary consonants arriving at a closed test that then erupts into a flutter, a taking off, recalls how easily portals, like a shutter, a screen, or a camera device allowing light to pass, are closed and opened. Like the DJ improvising a mix, inviting listeners to fill blank, blank spaces differently, Compton's recovery poetics, his audio interplay, has more meaning when we participate in the imaginative performance of Hogan's Alley. The physical rupture and displacement of the inhabitants of Hogan's Alley for an overpass remains in the ruins of the failed urban renewal project. The entire renewal project was eventually scrapped due to its overwhelming unpopularity, leaving only viaducts as the vestiges of the failed plan. However, the damage was done in Vancouver would never again have such a concentrated black community. So that's images of uh, the first phase of the Georgia viaducts, uh, the first phase of the planned uh, interurban freeway, which would initially run through uh, Hogan's Alley and much of Chinatown and Gastown. And the freeway was stopped by an alliance of Strathcona community activists and Chinatown business people. The freeway was blocked and Strathcona and Chinatown and Gastown were saved from the Wreckers Ball. And we'd have a different Vancouver, of course, if you could imagine. Uh, but not before that part of Hogan's Alley was demolished and the community displaced. Compton's concrete poem, Form and Chase, mirrors the image of the two viaducts in a piece titled Vividuct on the page beside the poem, and like the viaduct, provides a crossing, a ghosting between the past and the present. Form and Chase mirrors the viaduct and uses a typewritten font to emphasize the loss of an entire analog community, as if Hogan's Alley's history has been buried under the bridge. And Darren and I are going to read one more piece for you here. Which is... Form and Chase. A specter is haunting this font. In the attic of speech here, boxed up, is where accents go when you migrate, marry or wild them away. I am the shepherd in the yard of mended inflections, the first person buried under the plan of sepulchral dictions. My hands of breath lift, transpose, load letters. I am the bastard graphilect, offspring of Jane Eyre and the Rosetta Stone. The fading tones of improbable connections, fricative, glottal, remedial, settle here. My ectoplasmic ear notes, the Chinese next door shuffling mahjong, I mimic with lead ABCs. This is a pearl that was my tongue.
Thank you, Darren. Compton's poem depicts that while structures degenerate and cities change, memories and the histories of people continue to phantom the present. Compton's choice to use the archaic spelling of form, right, with the E, with the word chase, a printing term referring to the arrangement of text, emphasizes that while Compton is concerned with finding new ways to speak to the past, his bastard graphilect shows that written words are but a bridge, a portal, that often mimics what can only be partially recovered. Then again, the image of the viaducts is itself a graphic representation of where a vibrant community once lived, which remains alive, like the graffiti written on the viaducts, erased and then rewritten, since Compton's spelling of viaducts as vividuct comes from the Latin vivi, to live, to be alive, to survive. Compton's DJ spinning of the past with the present is, as he describes in his poem, The New Station, alchemical work, spinning, meaning out of meandering. I go over the remains, I transform, I translate. Compton's translation is very much an analog one into a digital present. That is, he takes the absence of a faded past and transforms the remains, ruins, runes, into a digital mix that speaks to the very mixedness of his own arrival. The poem, The New Station, is dedicated to Clarence Clements, a black lawn shoresman beaten to death by Vancouver police in the alley behind New Station Cafe in 1952. Carrie Taylor, a black dentist beaten by Burnaby RCMP in 1999. And for my high school buddies who became lower mainland police officers, all of them Asian. In the poem, Compton takes us through various stations describing a near collision event in a car at the age of 17, recalling the experience, quote, every time I cross this overpass, I'm keying on my PC now towards this terminus between the old train station rising at Terminal Avenue and the vanished new station cafe. Stations vanish and new ones crop up, recalling the passage of runaway slaves on the Underground Railroad towards their terminus stop in Canada. Time changes the stations, and given that Carrie Taylor was beaten because the officer responsible, in his words, saw a black man in a nice car with an oriental female, and given the area, he wasn't sure if it was possibly a prostitute pimp situation." End quote. It is one fitting justice that Compton's Asian Canadian friends are now police officers. Time, like bigotry and racism, also decays like the ruins of the past. Of course, this might be wishful thinking, Racism in Vancouver and Canada still exist in very open ways, right? We have conservatives right now talking about bringing Trump's platform to Canada. Or we have just last month, the anti-immigration party registering to take part in the BC election. This much, and now this announces this much, but we have also entered a multicultural era. Many of the stations are now liminal spaces between worlds, spaces of possibility, hope, digital spaces of remix. The final poem in Rune and in Performance Bond, Ghetto Fabulous Ozymandias, riffs on Percy Shelley's sonnet Ozymandias. Even reading the poem within the poem, Shelley's poem contrasts the inevitable decline of leaders and empires with the lasting power of art and contains the often quoted lines engraved on the statue of Ozymandias. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Around the colossal wreck of Ozymandias, nothing remains, as the poem speaks to the arrogance of empire. Except that the site of ruin for Compton is Hogan's Alley. In Compton's poem, the speaker who is in dialogue with Reverend Oz, a homeless preacher, describes that Shelley's poem was about arrogance, while this place, the community that was here, they were driven out. Their neighborhood was flattened by the city. There's nothing left here because of an injustice. It doesn't make sense to call the targets of this unfairness arrogant. Reverend Oz replies in one of the most telling moments in Performance Bond that it does make sense since it is arrogant to disappear. Today, Vancouver has over 20,000 black people. Compton points out that the perceived absence of blacks in Vancouver is an optical illusion. 
black people today represent a higher percentage of the total population than they did 50 or 100 years ago. Yet the majority of Vancouver's population, black people included, understand very little of the history or the existence even of Hogan's Alley. Compton has devoted so much time to, Ho to the Hogan's Alley Memorial Project because he sees himself as, quote, an after image of our history. The work of Compton and others hasn't gone unnoticed. Canada Post, as part of Black History Month in 2014, commemorated Hogan's Alley on a stamp. They also did the same with uh, Africville, which is another blighted community in Nova Scotia, another blighted black community. Features Fielding uh, William uh, Spots Jr., the first Baptist in Western Canada, as well as Nora Hendricks, right? grandmother of uh, Jimi Hendrix. She also worked at Vice Chicken and Steakhouse, where many prominent musicians would come and perform and hang out after in the day. Which Compton describes as, as a substantial success, quote, knowing that generations that are coming up now are going to have this as part of their regular landscape is very satisfying. More recently, visual artist Stan Douglas created an app where you can walk through Hogan's Alley circa 1948. So I have an iPad. It's a free uh, app. I recommend checking it out. A plaque was also put up in 2013 to commemorate the community as well, which Compton says speaks loudly about a community that people too often seem surprised exists at all. And just earlier this year, TELUS released a short docu documentary about Hogan's Alley, which you can check out uh, online on YouTube. These efforts by activists and artists gift future generations who will now have these works and memorials of Hogan's Alley as part of their cultural landscape. Compton remixes the past and combines various historical, theoretical, and literary samples to sound a more inclusive version of Canadian citizenship that opens up space for those, like the historical black community of Hogan's Alley, who have been alighted from official history. We could probably do the same you know, with looking at histories in Nanaimo, right? Uh, you know, I don't know much about uh, the history of Chinatown here, right? But I'm sure there's a whole you know, buried history there as well. Compton uses his own schizophono technique, what I call a DJ methodology, to map, blur, spread ideas freely, and to cross racial borders. The past remains a vast network for DJs to dig in and to work through. For Compton, the past is immediate because we think through the past and the present tense. In his poem, Declaration of the African Nation, Wade Compton asks, is a black rose natural? Is it indigenous to this coast? What if we look at a black rose as natural? That is, as organically and ontologically Canadian as anything else that is inauthentically authentic in Canada. Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who borrowed from the language of Martin Luther King Jr. when talking about the just society, rightly claimed that there is, quote, no such thing as an ideal Canadian. What could be more absurd than the concept of an all-Canadian boy or girl? A society which emphasizes uniformity is one which creates intolerance and hate, end quote. Canada is always changing as new people and ideas enter into the mix. Not necessarily in practice, but in theory and idealistically even in legislation, Canada belongs equally to all of its citizens. Sans indigenous people, we are all uneasy settlers here. We have an opportunity to resist the politics of division and accept that our story is one of fragmentation, but also of multicultural possibility. I'm not sure how the just society might ultimately sound, but I do know that the history of Hogan's Alley like other blighted histories, must be part of its conception. Like DJs attuned to the historical archive, we have a chance to engage and understand the past in order to build a more equitable future. As engaged educators, students, and citizens, we can see ourselves as consummate remixers entering into the larger Canadian sound mix. Or, and this is a warning, like Ozymandias, we can take a myopic and arrogant approach where we believe that only our sounding matters. One is an urgent call for collective understanding and healing. The other can only open up old wounds and lead to ruin. Thank you. <laughs>